looking at the story, um, the one story that spans all of Scripture. Uh, we saw God create the world and then humankind sinned, uh, brought death to humankind and brought a curse to the earth, a just curse. Uh, God told humanity, okay, uh, if you want to uh, rule the world like this, um, according to your own desire and design and will, I will let you. I'll let you try that for 120 years, and he did, and the results were disastrous. Uh, God observed humanity. The intent of humanity's heart was only wicked all the time, so God flooded the earth. He dealt with the injustice. He dealt with the worldwide violence, but he saved one family through the flood, and he made that family a promise. Never again will I destroy the earth on account of people. Never again will I curse the ground, even though people are wicked. Even though the intent of the human heart is only wicked all the time, there in that moment, God promised, my spirit will strive with humanity And God promised to deliver humanity from death, and he promised to deliver his world from the curse that was introduced in Genesis chapter 3. We saw God prove what he was doing at the Tower of Babel uh, when the people at Babel started doing the same thing that the people in Genesis chapter 6 started doing. Uh, But instead of letting them get too far, God intervened. He confounded their languages and scattered the people over the surface of the earth. We saw God choose Abraham. Uh, signifying that, hey, he's going to bring humanity along with him. He's not going to steamroll humanity. Uh, He is doing things slowly. He's taking very uh, intense steps, um, purposeful steps, because he is patient, uh, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance for the same reason he chose the nation of Israel to be his nation upon the earth uh, to represent peace, and justice and his mercy to the world, a nation through which to teach the entire world peace and justice and mercy. And we saw him interacting with Egypt, not just for the sake of delivering his people, but so that Egypt might know him and so we know the whole world. Uh, Every nation is part of his good plan for redemption uh, and uh, restoration, not only the nation of Israel, but the nation of Israel is his chosen nation through which to show the rest of the world peace and justice. Now, Israel has come to Canaan. They have been in Canaan now. We saw that God is not only redeeming people, but he's redeeming the ground so that he can establish people as prosperous uh, according to his word, his law. We saw that many of the laws given uh, were given because God knows how to treat the creation that he created. He knows how to treat nature. He knows how people should treat their bodies because he created them. He knows how to take care of them. So when we follow God's law, we experience that kind of prosperity which we talked about last week. And so Israel is living in the land of Canaan, and God establishes a king. Now before Israel went into Canaan, God predicted that Israel would ask for a king like the other nations. He predicted that Israel would ask for a king, and in Deuteronomy he says, here's what that king should be do. In 1 Samuel, we see God establish a worldly king in Israel in order to show Israel what a worldly king would be like. His name was Saul. He was really bad for Israel. He was very selfish in everything he did. He had uh, ungodly taxes upon the people. He oppressed the people. He took people to serve in his military, uh, and he gained a lot through his uh, selfish pursuits as king of Israel. Um, But God's plan was not to allow Saul or his descendants to remain uh, in this this position as kings over Israel. God brings about a man named, you know his name, right? The king of Israel, the first good king of Israel. His name is David, right? And so God raises David up and he makes David a promise. And we're going to read about that promise today and we're going to see how God continues to take steps toward the redemption of the world and the restoration of the world, uh, ending the effects of the curse that was introduced in Genesis 3 and even getting to a point where death itself is no more. So here we have 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8-12. through 12. David has already been made king, but this is God speaking to David through the prophet 
uh, Nathan and this prophet uh, is going to tell David the promise that God wants to make to David. So 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting in verse 8. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them. They're talking about Jerusalem. That they may live there in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. Even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people, Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. Why do you think God would need to establish a king for Israel? Why couldn't Israel just be led by God and not have a king? Why would Israel need a king? 400 years before David is established as king, God already said, when you ask for a king, I'm going to give you a king that I want you to have. This has always been part of God's plan for Israel. Before Israel wanted a king, God's plan was to give Israel a king. Verse 10 Um, God gives the purpose that he is giving David as king, that they, Israel, may live in their own place, that they may be established and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. Um, Israel had a lot of enemies, right? Uh, Israel experienced a lot of violence. Uh, People came against Israel. And by having a king, things would be a little more organized, and somehow they would become more peaceful. The enemies that Israel had previously uh, wouldn't be able to disturb them again, and the wicked wouldn't be able to afflict them anymore as formerly. Now, when David becomes king of Israel, there is a time of peace while David is reigning in Israel. There is a time when Israel is strong, a golden age, according to history, even extra-biblical history, a golden age in Israel. So God accomplishes his promise uh, during David's lifetime. So God has promised this peace. What? It sounds a lot like God promising peace. It sounds a lot like God promising justice. It sounds a lot like God promising mercy. All of the things that he's trying to teach the world as a result of his promise way back in Genesis chapter 8, like God is actually doing this and giving Israel a king uh, will somehow accomplish this. Now, I don't think it's fully accomplished under David, but here in a moment we're going to see how it will be completely fulfilled, completely accomplished. When your days are complete and you lie down, that's a euphemism, it means die, when you die with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. So God's not only promising David, you will reign as king, you will experience some peace in your time, a golden age for the nation of Israel, but your son will also become king, and I'm going to establish his kingdom. And we're starting to see a pattern, uh, what we might call a dynasty, the Davidic dynasty in Israel. Verse 13, He, David's son, shall build a house for my name, that will be the temple complex, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever, David's son's kingdom forever. Um, is this still a kingdom that exists? How long, how long will it last, according to God? Forever. I mean, so it's still here. Okay. And this Davidic throne is being set up, and God promising peace in Israel and into what wickedness, affliction, oppression, right? All of that. And God says this is actually going to last forever because this throne will never go away. It will always be there. And then God says, I will be a father to him. He will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul whom I removed from before you. Your house, I'm talking to David, and your kingdom shall endure before me. How long? Forever. 
forever. Your throne shall be established how long? Forever. Forever. In accordance with all these words and all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. We are about halfway through this series, uh, looking at this story. And so when it comes to our our teaching, our, our lessons that we've been having on Wednesday nights, like we're halfway through, and now God is setting up a kingdom on earth, a kingdom that is his kingdom with his king sitting on the throne, and he is saying there will be no end to this government. There will be no end to the purpose of this government which is to remove wickedness and affliction, I believe not only from the nation of Israel, but from the whole world. And because I'm establishing this king and this dynasty, like there will be a ruler on the earth forever from this point uh, who will benefit not only Israel, but all of humankind. Does that seem like a far-fetched promise to you? Does that seem to you like something we've seen bear out in history, like as we look at the historical record? Now, before we consider those questions, I want to show you first a prophecy from Isaiah and then its fulfillment in the New Testament regarding the throne of David. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 says this, A child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government of God will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government. That sounds like forever to me, right? Or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And then in Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33, really famous around Christmas time, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. This is the one Isaiah is talking about. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. So the Old Testament says this promise being made to David about his throne lasting forever, it will be fulfilled in the coming Messiah. It didn't name him. It didn't say in Jesus, right? It said in the coming Messiah, this deliverer, the one whose name is Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of what Peace, which is that's an important name in the Old Testament. Like Jesus is the one coming to fulfill, to sit on David's throne and bring peace to the world in wickedness, in affliction, in oppression in God's world. And then in Luke, Luke identifies this person in Isaiah as Jesus, who was born to the Virgin Mary. This is God. This is the Eternal Father. This is the Prince of Peace coming to reign. And there Luke says, when he comes, like he will sit on David's throne. He, he will be a king in the line of David. And he is a descendant of David. And his kingdom will last forever. There will be no end, he says. Isaiah says there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace, which is the goal lined out when God gives the throne in the first place, right? In Second Samuel. And, and then Luke says this kingdom, it will have no end. Jesus will be king and he will reign. And so when we see that, like bear out today in the way that we're thinking, There is no child of David, descendant of David, like sitting on a physical throne in Jerusalem still. But Jesus was crowned king. And since Jesus was crowned king and Jesus lives and he still works in the world today, he's still accomplishing the purpose of his throne as the king of the nation of Israel, we say Israel still has a king. Uh, The kingdom has not ended. Uh, This is forever and there is no end. But part of this kingdom, part of the prophecy, uh, part of the prediction that God gave to David in 2 Samuel and what we see in Isaiah is that not only would the, the kingdom never cease to expand, so even to nations beyond like 
Israel, I don't know, to like Egypt and Assyria, which we've already seen, like coming to worship God, right? Not only will the government never cease to increase, but also peace will never cease to increase upon the earth. Do you think we see this bear out today? Let me show you a couple of historical maps here because this is really cool. And it is evidence that like the promise of God is, is actually coming true. It's really amazing. Okay, so this is the Old Testament. These are the enemies of Israel, right? Surrounding Israel, all around Israel. You have Syria, Assyria, Babylon, Ammon, Moab, Edom, Amalek, Ethiopia, Egypt, and Philistia. All surrounding Israel, all the enemies of Israel throughout the Old Testament. Okay? And then you get to the time of Jesus. This is the, the red represents like where the Roman Empire is. Jerusalem is right here. Israel is right here, tiny, tiny little, and the, you see the angel's head right here and the wing coming down and the praying hands, like Israel is right there, okay? And so persecution against Israel has actually increased. Oppression of the Roman government has increased. Uh, John, who wrote the Gospel of John, who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and who wrote Revelation, describes all of the nations that are part of this superpower are against Israel persecuting Israel. And then you fast forward, and people really don't like the Jews in the world. From A.D. 1000 to 1593, people are expelling Jews from their countries, and Jews are having to run. Everywhere you see an arrow is where Jews are having to go from and to because of persecution against Jews in this part of the world. And then you get to a a small event, you know, in world history called World War II. Yeah. Okay, it was a little sarcastic there, okay? It's not a small event. Um, The hint would be World War, right? So Hitler persecutes the Jews. But I want to show you something here. What you see in green maybe aside from Russia, um, and the dark green particularly, in 1939, these are ultimately the nations that would rally together to defend the Jews. And so now we've gone from the whole world being against Jerusalem, being against Israel, being against the Jews, to now even in 1939, before the terrible thing called the Holocaust, right, to having a majority of countries and people around the world working together now to defend the Jews. This is quite the change in world history, quite the change in direction in world history. And then in the modern day, following World War II and the defeat of of Hitler in Germany and Stalin and Russia, you have modern day diplomacy here, everything in blue is allied with Israel. Not only this, but in, do you know what year it was? 1940, what? Israel becomes a, a nation, a state. 1940, what is it back there, babe? You're holding up a five, Seven, somewhere around there, Israel actually becomes a state. Like the whole world now recognizes, okay, we want Israel to be a state. Despite how small Israel is, they're like, they're like Israel is a state. We're going to recognize Israel as a state. And a vast majority of the nations on earth have recognized Israel as a state. And despite still having enemies in that area of the world, a vast majority of the world is allied with Israel, has diplomatic, good diplomatic relations with the nation of Israel. And this is how history has actually panned out. And so when God is speaking to David, saying, I'm going to establish a king, and through that king bring peace to Israel, we see ongoing, it is being worked out. And not only has Israel become known throughout the whole world, it was only known like right there in that section of the world, right? Now it's known worldwide, everyone knows who Israel is, the nation of Israel, but most nations are allied with the nation of Israel. So we see God's promise to David actually work out in history. I think this is cool to see, like when you can look at history alongside what the Bible says and 
confirm, like, okay, the Bible's predictions were true, like, it's true for Israel, right? When God makes a promise to David, it's true. When God makes a promise in Isaiah, it's true, particularly beginning with, with the advent of Jesus and the establishment of the one who will sit on David's throne forever from that point forward. Like, things have gotten really good for Israel, particularly concerning diplomacy, and really good worldwide. Um, most nations in the world experience peace with one another. This is the fulfillment of the promise. And so I think these maps actually speak a lot um, to us confirming the prophecies that we see and then also building our trust in what the Bible actually says. Uh, what we know from this passage of Scripture, from this step God is taking in the world, is that God is winning. Um, of course he's winning. He's God, right? Uh, he has established a king. Uh, he is saving the world, and therefore we praise his holy name, and we are greatly encouraged by that. Like, y'all, God is for us. He is not against us. He is the hero of the story, and the end result of the story is there will be no more death. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. There will be no more oppression. There will be no more injustice. There will be no more bullying. Like, that's, that's the end game, and God is taking steps to get there in such a way that shows patient with us, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance.